Welcome to the Face to Face Ministries podcast. I'm Kathy Little. And I'm Melinda Wilson. And we are talking all things inner healing, true connection with Jesus, and the full benefits package of the cross. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to episode... Episode 60. 60. Wow, that's a milestone. But you know, it's not just the fact that we're at 60 episodes... But this episode is being sponsored by Nav Press and the book by Dr. Jim Wilder called Renovated. And we interviewed Dr. Jim Wilder back in episodes 15 and 16. So if you want to hear more about him and know why we love him so much, please check that out. But we're excited to tell you about this new resource that he has just published. Yeah, you know, in the final years of his life, Dallas Willard, who many of you have heard of, led the charge on understanding that salvation is more than just a belief in God, but a new attachment to God. And Dr. Jim Wilder carries forward that work, reconciling how the brain works with the church's practices and transformation instead of thinking about God, we can learn to think with God. Yeah, and this harmony between brain science and spiritual formation is beautifully explained in Jim's new book, Renovated, God, Dallas Willard, and the Church That Transforms. Marcus Warner, who we also interviewed back in the earlier podcast episodes, he is the president of Deeper Walk International. And he has said of the book that, no one has taught me more about intimacy with God and relational discipleship than Jim Wilder. The opportunity to sit in on this cutting-edge discussion between a giant of the faith like Dallas Willard and Jim is a rare treasure. And for many people, Renovated will be the book that finally connects their soul to the father of creation. So visit renovatedbook.com. That's all one word, renovatedbook.com to get your copy. And you can even read the first chapter for free. Yeah, so thank you to NavPress for this opportunity to promote the book because we absolutely love Jim and uh, we're very excited about this resource. I think it's going to be really helpful to you guys. So thank you uh, for that. And so we want to make sure you guys know Dashaway Weekends for Ladies is on as scheduled. July 10th through the 12th in beautiful, gorgeous, stunning Lake Tahoe. Yeah, it's going to be at Zephyr Cove uh, Christian Retreat Center. And we've actually heard from our venue that they are opening their facility for retreats and conferences and events on June the 10th. We are scheduled for July the 10th. And as of now, everything is all green lights it's ahead. Moving forward. So, yeah, and we have discounted tickets right now, Early discounted bird registration. Pricing through April 30th. Yes. And if something happens, don't we'll worry about it. it. Later. <laughs> you don't need to worry about that. But I would encourage you to press forward, come through. This is, if ever, it's a wonderful time oh to come together gosh, for a retreat <laughs> in a beautiful place together with friends, old friends and new. It's now July yeah, our 10th team, to the 12th. Our team's going with or without you, but please come. Yeah. We'd love to <laughs> have you join us. It's going to be really good. And also, you know, during this time of uh, the lockdown, the shutdown, quarantine, whatever language you want to put on it, everything has come to a halt, but we're very excited. We've been having some strategy sessions during this time. I've got some folks that are speaking into this strategically. We've got something really exciting that we are building right now, and we're going to be rolling out in the next couple of weeks. So if you are not on our social media and you're not signed up to our newsletter, you might miss it, and you do not want to miss it because this is a really great resource that we are putting together that's very practical and incredibly valuable that you can have in your hands like right now. So we're working on that, and we're excited about that. So Melinda, where can they go on social media to find us? Well, you can go on face2faceministries.org. That's our website. You can go to Face to Face Ministries on Facebook and also Face to Face Men on Instagram. And, you know, with our newsletters, you're not going to be inundated. We do maximum one a month. And well, sometimes two if there's a special edition. Yeah, only but it's usually it's once a month. <laughs> But believe me, you want to be yeah, you guys kept want informed to know. of what's happening. Yeah, this is really exciting. So please, uh, by all means, be subscribed to the podcast to share mm-hmm. this and be connected to us on social and on our website and newsletter. We are very honored by who our next guest is. We sat down with him in his home in the rolling hills of beautiful <laughs> Tennessee, yes. and he was so gracious and humble to share some of his heart with us and how 
his heart has been healed and then how the Lord led him to develop some tools in helping others get set free. And this book that he wrote is called Freedom Tools. Yes. And our guest... Best-selling. Best-selling <laughs> book on heart healing. He wrote it with Jennifer Barnett. But our guest is Andy Reese, and we're so excited to share this interview with you. This is part one of our conversation with Andy. We had about an hour and a half conversation with him. So this is part one, and he's got some really great perspective. I mean, what they're doing with Freedom Tools is really accessible to the broad mainline denominational church and bringing them into a place of healing with some really amazing tools that are very solidly based in scripture and they're proven. So here's Andy Reese. We are so happy and honored to be with Andy Reese. And I, for those of you, for those of us in our audience who've not heard of Andy Reese, which I can't imagine who hasn't. Um, Most of, of North your... America and the <laughs> earth. Martians, not so much. They've all heard of you. <clears throat> yeah, okay. yeah we, we've been together a lot. Well, for those the the very minor the small minority uh, who's not familiar with you, can you tell us just who Andy Reese is, first of all? Well, he's a grandpa uh, and a father of four, and I uh, married a wonderful woman 35 years ago. Um, I come from an engineering background, so I've been an engineer. I retired a couple of weeks ago with air quotes around it, um, but uh, my whole life since probably. Three days after I got saved, um, I was I was praying in an upper room, not because that was holy, it's because the Father said, would you guys go upstairs, you're freaking me out. Okay, so <laughs> three of us went upstairs and we were praying, and, and I had this um, kind of this very vivid picture, vision-y thing that went on, and I was following, if I cry in the middle of this, it's okay. And, and, I, and I was following a white figure through a jungle, and we came to a gate, and he touches the gate, and I get a sense, this is Jesus. And we walk into this compound, and I'm floating behind him, like, like panning behind him. And in this compound, there are dingy white figures just sitting there, very white, and they're dark, dark black figures, like holes right through the vision. And as we walk in, the dark figures just start to slide between us and the white figures, to try to kind of obscure the, the view. And, stop it, one, one of the white figures just goes like this, just like a finger. And the Jesus figure walks over, reaches right through the black figure as if it's not even there, and shoo, pulls this white figure out. They turn, they walk out, and I'm, I'm like, wow, just electricity going through me, and I'm just energized. Now, I'm two days old in the Lord. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, the day before, okay, so it's like, like, well, saved at the Billy Graham crusade the week before that, so I'm, I'm maybe a week old in the Lord. And how old were you? Uh, 24. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> so time passes instantly, we're back at the thing, the door opens again, we walk in, and I go, wow, I get to see this again, and then he turns around to me and he goes, you do this, and I wake up and I like, holy, I didn't say moly, but I said something else. <laughs> and, um, and from that day to this day, that spent my heart. It's like, huh. And so um, I kind of laugh that I've, I've sort of been the Forrest Gump of inner healing. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, Forrest Gump was always um, a little bit, not knowing where he was going and what he was doing, mm -hmm. but always found himself sort of in the middle of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I unaccountably found myself in the presence of nearly every senior inner healing person in the next 20 years. Uh, uh, crazy stories, crazy stories. Um, Give uh, us one. Okay, so um, I am in... Uh, Jacksonville, give, I'm, I'm pretty well known in my field, mm -hmm. wrote textbook and all that, blah, blah. And so I'm giving a, a, a speech at a conference. I'm giving the keynote at a conference in, and that's in, your in work. engineering okay, for work. Yeah. yeah. And so I give the speech. It's late. I'm going to spend the night, leave about noon. I'm about to go down for breakfast, and I get a sense of weight. And I'm like, 
did I not have a quiet time? You know, I, I don't know. And so I think, okay, so I wait, and then it gets sense, yeah, go. So I go, the de- elevator door opens, and I literally bump into a guy. And it's a guy named Jim Beavis, who you may or may not know that name, but he's, he's been around in all these circles. And he goes, Andy, and I go, Jim? And he goes, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm at a conference. He goes, what are you doing here? And he goes, I and about 45 of the leaders of the charismatic movement of the 70s are in this hotel seeking God for the future of the charismatic movement of the move of the Holy Spirit and what we're supposed to do. And, and he goes, you want to come? And I, have this, and I have this false humility thing that goes, oh no, I'm not one of those people. Although I got totally turned on in the middle of the charismatic movement in the 70s. And it was, okay, he starts to walk away and God goes, boy, you know, it's like, I set this up for you. So I go, wait, wait, I'll come, I'll come. So I walk into this room and it is every one of my heroes, every one of them. Francis McNutt is there, you know, the Catholic inner yeah. healing, healing guy. Yeah. Every one of them laid hands on me and prayed for me. It's like, wow. I, I'm crying. So I'm crying now because I'm thinking about um, and, and I'm just wailing. I'm weeping. And I'm just, God, this is crazy, crazy. But wait, there's more. You know, now what would you pay? So I, I finally sit down and I'm talking to the guy next to me and he's talking about sexual brokenness, blah, blah, David Kyle Foster. I don't know if you know him, but, but yes, yeah, super. He is the guy about sexual brokenness. He, he has a really dark past in Hollywood. He was in one of the Friday the 13th movies. But, oh, wow. but in any case, we're talking, and I go, man, I'd love to get to know you more. And he goes, I go, where do you live? He goes, well, I used to live in L.A., but <clears throat> now I live in a little place you probably wouldn't ever heard of, Franklin, Tennessee. And I'm like, I, <laughs> I live in Franklin. What, you know, it's like, what neighborhood do you live? Well, I, you know, it's, it, it got crazy like that. And a woman is hearing us, hearing this whole thing, and she leans over and she says, um, you, should write, you should write a book about what you've been saying and, and all this inner healing stuff you guys were talking about. I said, I know. I said, I, I, have a, I have a book proposal that Michael Hyatt, president of Thomas Nelson, helped me write. I met him on a beach. I mean, another crazy story. <laughs> and, um, but Michael said, we couldn't publish it. Thomas Nelson couldn't. It's probably a little too out there for us, but I'll help you write a killer book proposal. And the woman says, I'm the chief editor of Chosen Books. Oh, I'll gosh. get Freedom Tools published for you, guaranteed. Jane Campbell. And I'm just like, I am just a pawn in a chess game, yeah. but I have a hand on me that just chuk, 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 moved me around. So, so that's how Freedom Tools came about. I mean, that, that was it. Well, let's, let's go back to the vision okay. that you had at yeah. 24 in the upper room. What did it mean to you? Did you know what it meant? I mean, Jesus uh-huh. said, you know, go and do this, but... I having, didn't know. So how did, like, what did you think it meant? Or did you have any idea? What? Well, so I thought to myself, uh, so my, my kind of motivational gifting is exhortation, and, and, and someone with that gifting, their thing is, is when they see a person, they say, are you reaching the call of God in your life? Are you reaching your potential? Are you walking in the fullness of who God? And if not, I, I'm going to help you. That, that's like your primary motivation. So that's always been my motivation, no matter what. And so, and so this was, okay, now you do it. And so then I was you know, on to college and on to graduate school and in the Army and and. and was always involved in church, was always involved with praying for people, didn't know kind of much about um, any of this kind of stuff, and then um, uh, began to read some things, but there was no inner healing really Mm -hmm. back then. John Mm -hmm. Sanford was just starting to write some things. Agnes Sanford had Mm -hmm. written her kind Mm -hmm. of class on it. And so I just fumbled around praying for people. I did deliverance stuff. It was always the house in the country at night deliverance, you know, shouted out. I mean, it was, it was just, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And um, somewhere along the way, so, so Don Finto was, um, came out of a Church of Christ background, started Belmont Church, which, which was the home church for Christian music. Mm. And, and he asked me to be an elder at age 33, which was 
crazy, you know, which was a, a young elder is an oxymoron, but we were morons and we said yes, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'll be an elder. So I was Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith's elder. It's like, no, no, you weren't. You, you just happened to be in the church and you're called an elder, but you were not. And, and so people would come to me and say, hey, can you pray for me? I've got something. Can you help me? And I thought, no. I, I mean, I'm an elder. I'm supposed to I'm supposed to know what I'm doing, and I have no idea what I'm doing. And I remember distinctly the first time a, a woman, a young woman, her boyfriend brought her, and she's semi-catatonic. Just, and, and he said, can you pray for her? I was with an older elder, and he said, oh my gosh, I've got to go. You handle it. And, and he walks out of the door, and I'm like, ah. And at that woman moment, a woman walks in. She sits on the floor, and she goes, oh. She closed her eyes. She starts to see. I have no idea who she was. I never saw her since. Um, don't think she was an angel, but she may have been. Um, I mean, that's how I got filled with the Spirit. Two guys came out of the woods, prayed for me, and walked back into the woods. <laughs> it's like, okay, crazy stories. I know. I have more crazy stories. Um, and so I begin to pray for her, and I'm like, I have no idea what to do. And I pull out Neil Anderson's steps. I had it stuck in the back of my Bible, and I looked. I, my eyes went down. I said, God, oh God, you know, that deep theological mm-hmm. prayer, God, oh God. Yep. And, and it, I looked at forgiveness and I said, tell me what, what has happened to you. And I'm going to keep a list of all of the bad things. Four pages later, I mean, it was rape. But, I mean, it was horrific stuff. Page after page. And I'm just writing it down. No, keep going, sweetheart. You, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I said, would you like to give these to Jesus? It's like mm. out of the blue. Would you like to give these to Jesus? Would you love, like to let them go and let him deal with it? And she goes, yes. I said, okay, let's start with the top. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to, and I'm making this up. I'm just <laughs> totally making this up. I said, I want you to, to tell Jesus what you think they owed you and didn't pay. Mm. And just tell. So, so you, you know, and I said, if you want to speak right to the person, she goes, no. And I said, do you want to sit with Jesus and talk to Jesus about? She goes, yeah. So he says, so Jesus, he owed me, he did this, he did this, he did this, blah 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 blah. Jesus, is there anything else? No. Okay, cross him off. Next one. And she just goes and says, and says, just Jesus, I give this to you. I give this to you. We're down about twenty things. And she is running. She's like, and Jesus, and she's like, I give this to you. I give this to you. I give this to you. And she is, she is now running ahead of me. She's going, well, who's next? Who's next? And she's like, choo, 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 choo. and then, then I, I asked her a hard question. I said, when she was all done, she's like, wow. And I said, would you be willing to give up your judgment of these people? And what did that mean to you at that time? So at that you time, you used that terminology before. Yeah, yeah. At that time, it meant to me, as it still means today, that is. I think I know why they did it. I think I can attribute motives to them, mm-hmm. and I can't. I'm not omniscient. And if I judge, judgment will ripple through my life. But I can give God judgment, and then this great, the weight of unforgiveness comes off, but the weight of judgment is just as heavy. It's like you can't say, I forgive you, you jerk. right? You, just, you can't do that. And so help them do that. And then we ask the question, which is, is like the third step that we've incorporated on fitness is, is Jesus, those were legitimate needs that I had. The, I still have those needs. Would it be okay if you met those needs? And she's just like, oh, oh. <laughs> I mean, we've all kind of seen that. It's just like, oh, <laughs> oh, 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 he's stroking my hair. You know, wow. just like, oh, it's so good. And I'm like, okay, I am totally hooked on this. I'm going to do this the rest of my life. Mm. And, and her and boyfriend. how old were you at that time? I was... 33. And that was, was that really the first time that you had a, well, I wouldn't say an official session, but yeah. was that like your first time that someone came to you and sought you out for that without well, you even? People came to me for years, but I always stumbled around. That yeah. was the first time they came and I felt like I was partnering with God mm. and it was smooth, easy, powerful. I didn't feel like the weight was on me to have the yeah. right answer. Yeah. And, and that's, that's always a killer for people who yeah, do this. Yeah, it is. It's like, and so, and so we spin off into, 
long lists or mm-hmm. we spin off into I got to get the technique just right or, yeah. or I don't do those things because I don't know, yeah. I'm not an expert there. And for me, watching that and, and multiple times after, I realize I facilitate a connection with the expert, but I don't have to be the expert. Can we deviate just a little we bit? I want to totally. go back to the yeah. story, but I want to, mm-hmm. while I'm thinking about it, that is such a good point because just personally, and I know I'm not the only one, and because you're just saying this, that we are afraid to, we're going to, we're afraid we're going to mess somebody up more or yeah. we're afraid to try something because we haven't studied Sozo or whatever the technique is. There's a million, uh, you know, for hundreds of hours. Where is that? Is there a line then between I'm familiar with these things and then the rest I'm going to just trust the Holy Spirit? Because obviously in this session you're talking about, I wouldn't even call it a session, Mm -hmm. this divine appointment that you had with this woman, Holy Spirit just downloaded stuff to you, probably bouncing off some knowledge that you looked at or read. But how is there a line then or... When do we know that we're ready for this kind of thing? Like someone wants to be, because we are mm-hmm. talking all things inner healing here, heart healing, yeah. transformation, sanctification, whatever. We're still learning the, the right verbiage for that. But when someone listening here, oh, yeah. I would love what he's, I love what I'm hearing, but I could never do what Andy Reese does. Right. When do we know that we're ready or how do we? Well, so that's a question with a tricky answer. And here, here would be my answer. So, so I, I had lists and lists and lists and lists. I have a shelf upstairs of every inner healing book mm-hmm. I've ever heard of, and some I haven't ever read, but looked through and went, yeah, okay, I get what mm-hmm. that is about. And I went, because I'm a geek, okay, I, I wrote the best-selling textbook in my field. I am geeky. <laughs> and I said, I am going to, I'm going to amalgamate all of this. I'm, gonna, I'm an organizer. I'm a, I'm a diagram. I'm going to get all of this. And when someone comes in, I can just follow this full chart. Mm. And at, at some point, God said to me, literally, throw your lists mm. away. And I was like, and, and it was a, I mean, a come to Jesus moment, but it was a, where is your dependence? Why is, why is what you're doing fear-based in you? Why are you afraid that you're not going to be enough? You're not going to be enough. Okay, <laughs> it's just get over it. You're not going to be enough. But I am more than enough. I am El Shaddai. I am the God who's more than enough. And if you will learn how to facilitate a meeting with me instead of feeling like it's a meeting with you and your knowledge, you will enter into rest. And so I threw away all my lists. And... And I, and I um, yeah, I threw away all my lists. And then I began to see in Scripture that when Paul talks about us, um, when, when he talks about someone maturing, when he talks about someone breaking sin, breaking entanglement, breaking ungodly belief, breaking wounding, there, nowhere in there is there an expert. There's, it's not there. You have Ephesians 4, you have pastors, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, to equip the saints for the work of service. And you realize that the growth of the church comes through ligament relationships of people speaking the truth one to another. That's how the church grows. God's plan is not, it's not like counseling or, or medical field where you have experts outside right. the system and you go out to them and then they refer you to somebody else his primary mode, I've come to really believe, is like the Red Cross says, everybody should know how to handle 90% of everything they encounter mm. because they're Red Cross trained. Mm. And the other 10%, they should be able to recognize and refer. Mm. But most of what we, we run into is kind of spiritually bruised knees and spiritual cuts and, spirit, you know, and, and there's some there's some deeper things from a counseling perspective, but they're not deeper from a God perspective. And so you see uh, Galatians 6, it says, if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. And I remember saying to myself, I wonder who they're talking about. I mean, 
not me, you know. <laughs> and but it's like, no, Andy, you're new, the word is pneumaticos. There's three kinds of Christians. There's sarkikos, flesh Christians, psychikos, mind Christians, pneumaticos, spiritual Christians. Mm. Paul makes a very very clear distinction. And inner healing has to be a pneumaticos operation. Mm. It cannot be a psychikos operation. Mm. Or it will be good, but it will never be glorious. Mm. But if it's over here in the pneumaticos, led by this, you who are spiritual, so I said, okay, it, um, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. Okay, so there's bear one another's burdens. And so you see all of these things. And I said to myself, I think God's pushing it down into the body as the first line of defense. What if I, so God, what if I just, is there a simple way to do that? Is there a simple way to push it down so that it becomes um, a, a conversation? You know, we, we kind of have a joke in Freedom Prayer, if you can't do it at Starbucks in 20 minutes, it's too hard. You know, and, it's, it's, and so we said, how do we push it without any thoughts about all the other experts who you need? I mean, you need an Andy Miller. You know, you need, you know, Denise here in town. I my, she's my go-to when mm-hmm. I when there's deep fracture, and so, and so I literally sat for a few days um, and said, God, how would you do it? And and out of that came came freedom prayer. So I knew Sozo, but really the only thing that that freedom prayer and Sozo have in common are some of the tools that are shortcuts. That's the only thing we have in common. The Father letter is not biblical, but it's a great understanding of how human needs and God needs gets met. Um, presenting G- or inviting Jesus is theophastic, but just Emmanuel. It's just kinder and gentler, and, and, mm-hmm. and we use kinder gentler. The four doors is just one of the many laundry list approaches. You could use RTF, you could use Neil Anderson's 10 steps, or you could use four doors. They're sort of a, I'm not sure what's wrong, let's just check all, mm-hmm. check everything, yeah. you know? But but I also <laughs> began to see, and this is a long answer to your question. No, it's good. But it's I also good. began to see, so I have a garden out there, and until last week there were tomatoes in the garden. And when I went out to the garden, unless I want fried green tomatoes, I only pick ripe tomatoes. I also began to see that a mistake that we sometimes make in the inner healing world is we think we're supposed to fix everything that we see in a person. Mm. But there are only certain things that are ripe. He began a good work in us. He'll complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. Um, and so, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. God is at work in you. And so I began to realize, and God just really spoke to me strongly about any. When you go after something that's not ripe, you'll get results, but they won't be lasting. They won't be powerful, and they won't be restful. And in a sense, you're violating that person. How do you know? You just know. Because if it's, if it's restful, if you're connecting to God, rather than a list, and you've got to go through the whole list, then you say, God, what do you want to do today? And you kind of follow the lead. And, yeah. and you, know, you step outside, and you, you, everybody yeah. makes mistakes, and like, Jesus didn't need five loaves and two fishes to feed the 5,000. He could have used an RC coal and a moon pie. Yeah. You know? and so, so it's like, <laughs> it's like he will use anything we <clears throat> offer to him, and he'll make it work. So I'm just talking about the things that make me comfortable. Mm-hmm. And so you just you say, what is? we find what God is doing, and it's often not what the person thinks when they right. first walk in. There's often a, a fruit, and then there's a root. Mm-hmm. And then the root takes out a whole bunch of other things yeah. going yeah. there. And so in freedom prayer, we just say, God, what are you doing now? We want to partner with what you're doing now. We, we see that you grow like this. And, and that's what we are. We're right here. We're a, a Romans 8 ministry, if you want to think of it mm-hmm. that way. So here's Romans in 20 seconds. So Romans 1 is the world's a mess. Romans 2 is so are you, don't gloat. Romans 3 is, um, I paid off all your past debt. Romans 4 is, that was by faith, and the rest of this is going to be by faith. Romans 5 is, I pay your monthly note. Romans 6 is, I put you in witness protection. Satan can't find you. Romans 7a is, the law can't find you either. 
your, your poster is not up on the, the post office anymore. Romans 7b is, and you're not crazy, you're not the problem. Sin inside of you is the problem, but you're not the problem. So, so all of that is past tense, right? So all of that is, is the cross and the resurrection. In Romans 8, it goes, there's therefore no condemnation. And then, boom, he switches gears and he says, if by the Spirit you're put into death, the mindset on, on the flesh is death. The mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. As men as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Father sends a Spirit crying out, Abba, Father. And all of a sudden you realize, holy moly, Romans 8 is this. Romans 8 is this breaking free. Romans 8 is putting to death the things that, that bind you. And it's quick. There's, there's rapid change. We always tell people, you, you still have the ability to think that way, act that way, misbehave that way, but you no longer have the obligation to. Freedom says the jail door is open and you can walk out. If the jail is so familiar you love it, you can lock the door again yourself, but you don't have to. And we tell people, come out. And Jesus typically take, goes with them, you know, leads them out. And so we say that freedom tools, freedom prayer, is a Romans 8 ministry. We're breaking the things by the Spirit. We're putting those things to death. Then Romans has a trip to Israel, right? 9, 10, 11. I don't know why it's in there right there, but it is. And then Romans 12 is be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then walk into your gifting, then function in the body. That's counseling. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind is cognitive behavioral. I mean, and so we partner with a lot of counselors. There's a psychiatrist who, who's used our stuff. And they all say, Andy, <coughs> we, f- we believe you now. And we, f- we found, and Jen, mostly Jen, who's the co-author, uh, she should be interviewed here because um, she's like amazing. Um, but we, f- we find that we can get further in one or two freedom prayer sessions than we can in 15 counseling sessions. But then once the issue's been set free, then we can come back and, and with our counseling, we can help them fold these things into their lives so the transformation is completed. And so we see ourselves right there. Let's um, talk a little bit more about your book, Freedom Tools, okay. and how that was birthed and also about your ministry. Sure. So how was this book, Freedom Tools, when did you write it? Uh. Somewhere in the 90s. I'm not great with oh, dates. Oh, I didn't know it was that. It's been out that long. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, the wow. first version, first okay. edition. Um, I, I think now we might have to edit this as we go back and, and look at an old <laughs> version and look at the copyright of it. But it was quite a while ago, I, I think. Um, and so that came about because um, I began to see that... that and so, so I... Being the force gump of inner healing, I have spent hours with nearly every person, and um, nearly, nearly every person in inner healing. in inner healing yeah. in the roots of it, especially yeah. um, just uh, just bumping into them, just pestering them with questions till so they said, "Let's get dinner," you know, something <laughs> like that. I mean, I'm that guy, and so um, at some point, I began to see. Um, some gaps in what I felt called to do. And I looked around, and, and while Sosa was the closest thing, um, I felt like there was some, some things. You start with these tools, and you go, okay, are these tools biblical? And you go, well, they're derived from the Bible, mm-hmm. but surely Jesus has has told us how to do this. Surely he's taught us. Surely if we're supposed to bear one another's burdens, set people free, um, all that, surely in the scripture it tells us how to do that. And so I looked and looked and I was like, well, it's pretty indirect. I mean, it, it, doesn't, really, mm-hmm. it doesn't really tell you how to, how to do that. And um, so here we go, chest, little chest pawn again. I, I I go I I I go to sleep asking that question, Jesus. 
do we need to read all these books? Surely you, how did you minister? And I, I looked at the woman at the well and all these, and Nathaniel, and I said, okay, well, you're the son of God. Um, I guess you're in me. So I could, and I felt, and I went, <gasps> and I woke up at like 2.45 in the morning, just ahead of the witching hour. I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh. And, and inside of me, Jesus had spoken to me in the night. I mean, I, you, you hate to say God said or God told me, <laughs> except for the fact that, that now we have 5,000 cases of fruit from this revelation, and so I know it works. And this is what basically what I heard. You know the parable of the sower of the seeds? Mm-hmm. So that is Jesus saying to people, if you are trying to share the gospel, these are the four kinds of people you'll meet. And here's their motivation. Mm. And so if you really want to be successful, find kind four. The rich and ruler would be this kind. The riches and cares of this world has choked out the seed, right? And so, and, and I went, yeah. And he said, the parables in Luke 15 are the answer to the Pharisees' question. So it says in Luke 15, Jesus was ministering to sinners and the scribes and Pharisees said, this man ministers to sinners and dines with them like there's any other kind. And so, and it, and it says, and I, I never saw this before, it says, and so Jesus told them this parable, singular. Then he tells the parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, the prodigal son, and the older brother. Parallel, absolutely mm-hmm. parallel. And what he said to me is, is, Andy, if you will understand these parables, you'll know how I minister. And I'm like, so let's take lost coin. You say, okay, so what do we know about a coin? A coin is, it has intrinsic value. The metal that makes it, makes it valuable. It also has printed, imputed value. Somebody else has told it its own value. It has the face of the king on it. What did the coin do to get lost? Nothing. It's in a dark and dirty place. Well, what is a coin in real life? Well, a coin is someone who's wounded, right? Intrinsic value. Lost through no part of, fall to their own. In a dark and dirty place, they feel devalued, they feel abandoned, they feel all of those things. You know, a child in the womb wants to know two things. Is the world safe and am I acceptable? Those are the two things everybody comes out of the womb wanting to know. And the wounding is, it's not safe and you're devalued, mm-hmm. Right? And so, and so what is Jesus' ministry solution? First of all, he's got a woman. Why a woman? Because people who are wounded don't need dad to say, buck up, right? Yeah. They need a woman, nurture, love, ooh, you know, uh, if, if uh, yeah, I mean, you go to mom when you got a boo sure. on your knee, right? And so when you're wounded, you go, so why a woman? What does she do? She shines a light. What is that? It's truth. Because... It's, as Ed Smith said so eloquently, it's not what happened to you that is so bad. It's what you believe about what mm-hmm. happened to you that really screws you up. So shine a light is to bring to sweep the house, is to remove the sense of being tainted, of being dirty, of, being, uh, of, of you being disqualified because of what happened to you, right? Then throw a party. So back, and, and the woman throws a party to celebrate finding the lost coin, Right? And so Jesus, if you look at all four of the parables, Jesus redefines repentance, totally redefines it. You go, see, we have, re, because at the end of it, it says, so, it, so there's more joy in heaven over a sinner who repents. And you go, okay, so sin is involved in all four of these, but repentance is redefined by Jesus as willingness to be found. Just, see, the prodigal came back with his crazy story, and the father's like, I don't need no stories. My son is back. So repentance for the prodigal is willingness to be found by the father. Mm. Right? And so you have the lost sheep. Well, what's a lost sheep? Sheep are stupid, you know, like people. And so and so a sheep goes further than it thought it would go, it stayed longer than it thought it would go, it paid more than it thought it would pay, and it doesn't know how to get back. It wasn't bad, it was bad. You know, it just it just did sorry, dad jokes are a thing. Um (laughs) 
And, and so you say, okay. what is that? Well, that's entanglement. That, that's a, mm. Hebrews talks about the, the encumbrances that so easily entangle us, mm. right? Sin and encumbrances are two different things. And so that's entanglement. And entanglement is, is playing with a Ouija board when I was young. It's having sexual relations outside of marriage. It's fornication. It's all the soul ties. It's, it's, there's, there's, and in the book, there's, there's long lists of, of entanglements. So what happens there? You have a shepherd. Why a shepherd? Why not a mailman? Shepherd know where sheep go. <laughs> shepherd know what to do. And so he, he searches till he finds it, step one. Two, he puts the sheep on his shoulders. Three, he takes the sheep back and has a party to celebrate, to affirm the finding of the sheep. Well, what does that look like? Well, he bore our sins and he bore our sorrows. So he's bearing the lamb back. But the other thing is that, is that the lamb begins to see things from the, from the vantage point of mm-hmm. Jesus. It goes, mm-hmm. oh. And so in a freedom prayer session, the person goes, oh my gosh. I mean, it's just like, and then it's like, Jesus, I, I see now the cause and effect. I see it. I see it. Like a young man was judging and, and he, he judged his mother at the birth of, of his brother and, and, and just said, you know, and, and she did something unfortunate. She turned and kept the baby from because she thought he was going to kill, you know, not just hug the baby to death because he was so excited. And, and so, so he came, he flew in from Oregon and he said to us, every girl just wants to be my friend. They just want to talk to me. I'm sick of it. What is wrong with women? And I'm going, how many times does this happen? He goes, six. You know, it's like repeated stuff is judgment. It always mm-hmm. is. And, and, and I said, I didn't say, who are you judging? I said, well, let's ask Jesus. Where, what, what do you want to show us? We always ask open-ended questions mm-hmm. in free prayer. Mm-hmm. Jesus, is there anything? Jesus, or Holy Spirit, but typically Jesus, would it be okay if? And he said, Jesus, would it be okay if you showed us where this, and he goes, well, I haven't thought about this in years, which we know is a dead yeah. giveaway <laughs> in, in healing stuff. Okay, I'm on the right track. And um, he came back to this thing about his mother. He said, would you be willing to forgive your mom? He forgave her, and then he goes, oh my gosh, she wasn't being mean. I just saw it as her being mm. mean. Oh, she was, I was so rambunctious. I'm a rambunctious guy. And, and so, he, so he did that. He repented of judging. Um, he repented of, of all these opinions about all these women. Um, he gave his, 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 himself to Jesus. They had this wonderful connection. He's like, oh, this is great. He flies home. He calls me three weeks later. You'll never believe what happened. I'm like, I can guess, but come on. He goes, I'm engaged. And I'm like, <laughs> what? And he goes, and I've changed my major to counseling. And I said, why? He goes, I didn't tell you this in the session, but Jesus said to me, the part of me that you carry is wonderful counselor. Mm. And he said, that's why the women wanted to come and talk to me oh. because I'm a wonderful counselor. But Satan always gets you in this catch-22 where your gifting is your curse. Oh. Right? And so he broke out of this. He became wonderful counselor. Mm. Married to a wonderful woman. And it's like, whoa. So, so he was entangled in this. He, he wasn't trying to do something bad. He just was. And when Jesus showed him the, the demand that Satan had put on his life and the deception, Satan saw was a legalist or an opportunist, he broke free. And it, it was instantaneous change. Now he has a chance to go to Romans 12 and walk out his gifting, walk out how this fits in his life, because... Uh, unbelief and entanglement seeps into all parts of our life, mm. but God ferrets it out with you. Holy Spirit says, okay, lesson today is, you go, oh, and so it starts this transformational process. So it's like we embed this living truth in someone that starts a transformational process in them. Now, had we gone, okay, now let's talk about every other part of your life, it, it would have fallen flat, but he came for that one thing. And that thing sent him on a course of growth for who knows how long. Now, at some point, he's going to be caught up short, mm-hmm. and he's going to go, Jesus, what about this? Mm-hmm. And Jesus will say, glad you asked. It's now a ripe tomato. So that's entanglement. Sin is, is pretty obvious. The prodigal does all his prodigal things. Mm-hmm. So, so when he comes back, 
he's coming back, and Jesus uses what's called a remiz, which is, is he's actually referring to Pharaoh, because Pharaoh is plotting destruction, mm. and, and, the, and the younger son is plotting how he can make money when he comes back. And he says, make me as one of your hired servants, right? The father isn't even listening to him. And the father runs to him and gives him three things every sinner needs. He gives him a robe, he gives him a ring, and he gives him sandals. Those are the three things that, that we've discovered. Every sinner, a sinner needs to know they're forgiven. That, that's step one that the father gave him. Mm-hmm. Then he had a party in the honor of the son so that the shame would, would be mm-hmm. obliterated. A robe is you're forgiven, you're righteous. A ring is you're mine, you're an heir. You have authority. And sandals is you have ministry, you're not in time out. Mm-hmm. Slaves don't have sandals. You have sandals, right? So then we have the older brother. So the older brother is like the perfect child, right? But, but he doesn't know the father any better than the prodigal mm. knows the father. Mm. Um, yet he's there. And so he, he is a slave in the house of the father. And so he hears of this party. So the father, this is a small, tight village. He's not out on some big estate. Everybody is watching the father bear the shame. Everybody is watching the father bear the older, the older brother's scorn. They're mm-hmm. watching them, him do that. So the father is, it's like why a father for the prodigal? If you crash the car and mom says it's okay, it's not okay. It's not okay until dad says it's okay. In the same way, so the, so the father comes out and he says, again, three things that everyone who has an ungodly belief about the father needs to hear. Because the belief is always one, one or more of three things. So he comes out and he says, My son, you've always been with me. Everything I have is yours. And that's the answer to the three questions everybody who has an ungodly sense of God needs to know. My son, relationship, you're in the family. You sleep here. You don't go home at night. Um, you've always been with me. Proximity. He's... I know I'm saved, but he's distant. No, you've always been with me. You just don't know how to access me. You just don't know. It, it, you, you come this way, and I'm right here. Mm. I'm right here. I'm right here. God the Father told me once, um, I used to uh, practice going into his throne room, and it's just crazy good. And then you know, I got to go, and finally he said, why do you ever leave? And I was like, I guess when you're everywhere, I don't have to leave, do I? And he goes, no. Oh. <laughs> No, you, you just live out of the throne room. I'm like, wow, what a concept. So, um, so proximity. I've, I've, you've always been with me. Everything I have is yours, generosity. Those are the three things that people think God won't give to them. And so when you encounter those ungodly beliefs directly, and often they go to the Father with ungodly beliefs, sometimes they can't go to the Father, so Father Ladder is a great tool for connection with the Father. Um, Oh, the stories, you know, you can, we can all tell. Um, and, and then he has a party, but it's a very different party. Because in this parable, um, it stops, right? The, it, it stops before the party. He's, he invites the, the, the brother in. But the other three, Jesus was talking about the people he's ministering to, but the last one, he's talking to the Pharisees about the Pharisees. And they knew it. They knew it. He's talking to the church about the church. You know me in your head, but you're a slave. You don't know me. You know about me, right? And, and that's, I don't know, I probably prayed with 50 pastors, and mm. that's been the case almost invariably, is, is just a weeping connection to the Father. Um, but what he does is he says to the older brother, you come and sit with me and host the party. In other words, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exceed all. If you're willing to humble yourself and accept your other brother back, I will put you in the seat of honor with me, and you will host the party. I'm going to promote you to the head of all of this with me. Not instead of me, but with me. It was the best offer ever. <laughs> Jesus was giving the Pharisees the best offer ever. And so, back to the storyline. So I woke up, and, and I'm, I'm writing all that down. Mm think wounding, entanglement, sin, ungodly belief. So from, from that day to this, no 
person I've ever prayed with wasn't a combination of those four things. Mm. It's like, mm. that makes it simple. I don't need a list of 75 things. All of those things on that list fall under these categories. Entanglement's got a list of 7,000 things under it, but they're all entanglement, and they're all handled the same way. And so I said, okay, well, that makes sense. So God, you've told us about how to, how do we get rid of these things? And he said, well, it's pretty simple. You confess sin and repent of it. Duh. Entanglement, what do you do? You break the entanglement. Got it. Wounding, you hear truth and you forgive. Check. Ungodly belief, you hear truth and you renounce the ungodly belief. And in all four of these, you connect with God and you stay connected with God afterwards. And you, you're transformed and you go, that doesn't seem hard. Well, thanks so much for listening to part one with Andy Reese, author of the best-selling book on inner healing right now, Freedom Tools. And uh, again, this is part one, so make sure that you are subscribed. And uh, again, we mentioned Dashaway Weekends. Dashawayweekends.com will give you all the information you need, and you can register there as well. We really would love to have you guys join us. I'm seeing all your faces there, just full of joy and smiling back and forth (laughs) and happy to be with one another. But yeah, we would love to have you there. Thank you so much for being part of this podcast. We look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah, make sure you go grab your copy of Renovated. You'll be glad you did. We'll see you next week.